Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Well, let's look to the Word of God together, everyone, in 2 Peter chapter 3 this morning. 2 Peter chapter 3. As we ask this question today, which is the title of our message, what kind of people ought you to be? That's a question asked by the Apostle Peter in our scripture text this morning. What kind of people ought you to be? Peter is asking that question in in a particular context. He's saying, in this world in which we live, when Jesus may come at any moment, What kind of people ought you to be? Well, let's read it. We'll read together the entire third chapter, the last chapter of 2 Peter today, beginning at verse number 1. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. First of all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised? Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed And the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord... A day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping His promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire. And the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. That day will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. But in keeping with His promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with Him, with the Lord. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you, wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all his letters, speaking in them of these matters. Paul's letters, writes Peter, contain some things that are hard to understand, which ignorant and unable peop- uh, unstable people distort as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. And everybody said, Amen. What kind of people ought you to be? That's the title of our message this morning, and that's the question asked by the Apostle Peter in our scriptures today. Peter was near the end of his life. Talking with someone just recently, this week as a matter of fact, a fellow preacher, we were talking about Peter's letters, 1st and 2nd Peter, both written near the end of his life. And isn't it true that at the end of life, we have a lot more wisdom than we had at the beginning of life? 
And the Peter we see in his letters is a Peter who has grown so much since we first met the Apostle Peter in the early days of his connection with the gospel. And as Peter writes these two letters, he writes them near the end of his life. In fact, the Lord Jesus has revealed to Peter that he is about to go home to be with the Lord in heaven. And Peter knows his time is short. And Peter writes near the end of his life to remind Christians that Jesus is coming again. It's going to be a dreadful thing for this wicked world, but it's going to be an awesome and a blessed thing for the people of God, the followers of the Lord Jesus. How many of you here today are glad to be on the winning side? Say amen. That's the side of Jesus, the followers of Jesus. You know, these are crazy days in which we're living, and many Christians today are asking, as Christians have asked for the last 2,000 years, could this be the season in which Jesus will come again? Well, my answer, as Peter's answer would be, would be this. This may indeed be the season. How many of you know that's a safe answer? This may indeed be the season. We do not know. But in every season, we must be ready. We must not be deceived or lulled into thinking that this world will go on forever like it's going. There is coming a cataclysmic divine intervention into this world, prophesied and described throughout the pages of Scripture, the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many of you believe with me this morning that Jesus Christ is Lord over this universe? Say amen. And he is Lord over this world. He may not be the acting Lord over your life, but one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And Jesus is coming again someday. In light of that impending and approaching return of Jesus, Peter gives us three exhortations for our consideration today. And I, wanna, I, I want to examine these three exhortations together as the people of God. Number one, Peter urges us to engage God's promise. Now, how many of you in the house today have ever heard somebody say, Jesus is coming again? <laughs> Let me see your hand. Well, obviously you have heard that. If you've been in church very long, and if you've been in a Bible church, you've heard that truth declared, Jesus is coming again. At the end of Peter's second letter, Peter urges the followers of Jesus to engage that promise of God again. Never forget it. Jesus is coming again. The scriptures speak. Jesus is coming. Listen to verse number one. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the, the, the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given you by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Peter is reminding us that throughout the scriptures, there is this promise of the Lord's coming again. Let me remind you today that the Old Testament prophets predicted not only the first coming, but the second coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to this now. Daniel, Isaiah, David, Zechariah, Malachi, Joel, and Job all referred and prophesied the second coming of the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only did the Old Testament prophets make that prediction, but Jesus himself promised that he would return. In John chapter 14, he said to his disciples, I'm going away, but I'm coming again to receive you and to bring you with me to be where I am. And in Matthew 24, Jesus said, keep watch because you do not know what hour your Lord will return. The Old Testament prophets, Jesus himself, you may have forgotten this one, but the angels promised that Jesus would return. Acts chapter 1, the angel said, this same Jesus 
who's been taken up from you into heaven will come again in the same manner as you have seen him go into heaven. The Old Testament prophets, Jesus himself, the the angels, the New Testament apostles preach that Jesus will return. In fact, are you listening this morning? Every New Testament writer, some people want to relegate the promise of the return of Jesus to some category of the weird and the obscure, but I want you to understand here that the promise of the second coming of Jesus lines the pages of Scripture. And every New Testament writer wrote about the coming again of our Lord Jesus. Paul wrote about the rapture in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 Thessalonians 4, and Titus 2. James wrote in chapter 5, verse 7, be patient till the Lord's coming. Jude wrote, the Lord is coming with thousands upon thousands of his holy ones. Hebrews, we don't even know who wrote Hebrews, but the unknown writer wrote in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 37, in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. John wrote the entire book of Revelation looking forward to chapter 19 and the second coming of our Lord Jesus. The gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all recorded the prophecies. And Peter, here in our scripture today, prophesies the two-sided coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Destruction and devastation for a wicked world. Deliverance and heaven for the followers of the Lord Jesus. We see it in the scriptures there. A day of doom and destruction is coming. Verse 7 says, by the same word of God, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Verse 10, the heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. That day, verse 12, will bring about the destruction of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the heat. A great destruction of this wicked world system. A day of doom and destruction is coming. But Peter assures us that a day of divine deliverance is coming as well. Verse 13 says, "But, but in keeping with God's promise, we, we followers of Jesus are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. (laughs) Now, we come to the closing words of the book of Revelation. We are reminded that the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. I believe that's where this fiery work takes place. And there was, John says, a new heaven and a new earth. And Peter says, we're looking forward to that new heaven and that new earth, the home of righteousness. The Bible is clear that Jesus will rescue those of us who are his followers and will bring us safely home to his heavenly kingdom. And as children of God, we're looking forward not to judgment, but we're thanking God that Jesus already bore our judgment on the cross. Would you say amen? And that Jesus is going to rescue us and bring us safely to his kingdom. And in the end, we, the blood-bought children of God, will live in heaven on earth forever. No wonder the Apostle Paul referred to this whole series of events as our blessed hope. Jesus is coming again, and that is good news. Would you say amen? Scripture speaks, Jesus is coming. Look at me, everybody. You cannot be a scholar or even a student of Scripture and deny the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. You just just cannot camp in the Bible and forget about or somehow mark off as unimportant the doctrine and the assurance of the coming again of our Lord Jesus Christ. In fact, Peter says that scoffers will scoff, but Jesus is coming anyway. How many of you understand that God's enemies are ultimately no problem for him? (laughs) And those who resist him will in the end learn that God is God. Verse 3, Peter writes, you must understand that in the last days scoffers will come. Scoffing and following their own evil desires, they will say, well, where is this coming? He promised. Ever since our fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. And in fact... 
you and I who are here today, if you're like me, I'm 55 years old, I've been in church my entire life, I've been hearing the promise of the rapture and the coming of the Lord Jesus my whole life, and I could, you could become cynical and, and, and say, well, I've been hearing about that my whole life, but I haven't seen that, but we're going to be quick to learn that with the Lord... A day is like a thousand years. A thousand years are like a day. God's timetable is not our timetable. And just because things haven't happened in our timetable doesn't mean that God's promise has fallen or failed. Peter says these scoffers will say, well, where is this coming? Everything's the same. Verse 5, but they deliberately forget that long ago... By God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters also, the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of ungodly men. Peter's point is this. People have doubted God's prophecies before, but they came to pass anyway. How many of you know people thought Noah was a nut? But they were to find out that Noah was not a nut, that Noah had the word of God. And just as Noah prophesied and predicted, the flood came and took them all away. Peter says those who want to discount the promise of the Lord's return willingly forfeit their knowledge and awareness that God's prophecies have come to pass over and over again. Peter's point is that God's word is going to come to pass despite the scoffers. And the prophecies and promises of the return of Jesus will prove true despite what anybody has to say. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes in Romans that if everybody, are you listening to this today? If everybody disagrees with God, let God be true and everyone else a liar. That's the, bo- the bottom line is God's word is going to prevail whatever anybody else thinks. Some today reject and ridicule the return of Jesus right from their pulpits. My my response to that, they need to get out of the pulpit. The pulpit of the church is a place for preaching the Word of God. Not abandoning the Word of God. Unfortunately, the church has often assisted the scoffers by veering off into sensational but unbiblical teachings And by setting dates for the Lord's return again and again and again and again and again. Are you awake this morning? Let me give you some news this morning. We are headed toward the fall season. And I'm sure that somebody, maybe even some in this congregation, will once again say, well, sometime in October... The Lord is surely going to come again in the rapture. People, when will we learn to trust that Jesus knew what he was talking about when he said no one knows the day or the hour? Let me ask, are you you awake this morning? Who are you to think you know what Jesus said you wouldn't know? And the church has assisted the scoffers by setting dates and manipulating the the interpretation of the stars last year. You know, the stars line up in the shape of some odd... Friends, the reality is we ought to just recognize that, that Jesus himself wants us to be ready every day. Listen, despite the scoffers and despite the abuses of well-meaning Christians, Jesus will return. Many of you like me and like the Apostle John would say, well, come on, Jesus. Do, do, you, think he, 
Maybe he'll respond to that this morning. Look up and say, come on, Jesus. That's, that's our heart's desire. If the Apostle John could say, come quickly, Lord Jesus, I say it as well. Come on, Jesus. If Jesus is coming, we say, well, come on. And yet Jesus has not yet returned. We are still waiting and hoping and longing and looking. Peter says, Jesus, get this, has not yet returned because of God's patience. Okay? So, Peter urges us to engage God's promise again. Don't let that promise go. Jesus is coming again. Secondly, let's examine God's patience. And the first thing we say about God's patience and this delay of the coming of Jesus is that there is love in God's delay. Okay? Verse number 8, look at it. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise to come back again, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So Peter plainly says here that the reason Jesus has not yet returned is so that more people can be saved. Okay? Now, make these two notes with me. Peter preached salvation as the point of God's patience. There it is again in verse 9. If, if, if we can reread this verse, it's okay because every Christian believer ought to have this verse of Scripture memorized in your spirit. Are you listening? The Lord is not slow. Read it out loud with me. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise as some understand slowness. He is patient with you. Read it out loud. Not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Not only did Peter preach that, but Paul preached salvation as the point of God's patience. And this is an unusual reference. Look at verse number 15. Bear in mind that our Lord's patience means salvation, just as our dear brother Paul also wrote you with the wisdom that God gave him. He writes the same way in all of his letters. Paul, here, here is Paul referring to Peter's letters. Okay? Or, or Peter referring to Paul's letters. Okay? And he says, Paul's letters contain some things that are hard to understand. Anybody here ever found that true? Let me just, let me just say, it is very liberating for Peter, the apostle, to write and say, some things Paul writes are difficult to understand. Isn't that liberating? That gives us a permission slip to say, ooh, that's hard. If Peter said it was hard, we can say it's hard. Peter says, ignorant and unstable people distort Paul's words as they do the other scriptures. And I want to pause right there just to make a quick note to say that it's interesting here in the year maybe 64 or so A.D. when Peter writes this letter, it's interesting here to see that Peter affirms in his letter already that Paul's letters are Scripture. Do you see that? Okay, so by, by this time in church history, Paul's letters are already not just letters written by Paul to the churches, they are already considered by the church as anointed Scripture provided by God. Paul has been writing these letters. And Peter says that unstable and ignorant people distort Paul's words as they do the other scriptures to their own destruction. Now, both P is everyone still awake? Say amen. amen. Both Peter and Paul emphasize the truth that the delay in Jesus' return is about seeing more people saved. Are you here? If you're like me and grew up in the old Pentecostal church, you used to sing a song that went like this. Hold the fort, for I am coming. Jesus, signal still. Wave the answer back to heaven. 
Three people are as old as me. By thy grace, I will. We everybody used to take their handkerchiefs out and wave the answer back to heaven as if the Lord needed to see that handkerchief, you know. Hold the fort. Well, that old song, Hold the Fort, has gotten a lot of grief over the years because preachers have reminded us sometimes that we're not just to be holding the fort and hankering, hunkering down waiting on the Lord to rescue us, we're to be out and about doing the work of God and expanding the kingdom. Could I have an amen? Amen. There's work to do. Jesus said himself, keep busy until I come again. Sometimes it would be nice just to find a corner and hide in it till Jesus comes again. Isn't that right? Even in the midst of all of this thing we're in right now, in our society, sometimes it'd be better just to find ourselves a corner and hide. I told somebody not not long ago, you know, I've been the pastor at First Assembly for 27 years this summer. You know, it's a good time right now for a two-year sabbatical. How many of you know that sounds good to everybody once in a while? I have no plans to do that. So So don't start writing me off yet, please. But the truth is sometimes we'd like to just escape it all. We'd like to do like the psalmist said. We'd like to fly like a bird over to the mountain. <laughs> Doesn't that sound good? Fly like a bird over to the mountain. Let's find ourselves a place to hide. But the truth is Peter and Paul emphasized that until Jesus comes, we need to be reaching people. And this delay of the coming of Jesus is about, is about giving people more time to be saved. Listen now. And obviously, by this point we know, the delay in the return of Jesus is about offering salvations to increasing generations of people. Isn't that right? Do you see that? So what does that say to us? <laughs> that says... Not only is God a God of love and doesn't want anyone to perish, wants all who are saved, who who will be and who are willing to be saved. Not only does it say that Jesus died and rose again to save the human race and to eventually populate heaven, but because of the delay in the return of Jesus, because here we are 2,000 years later and the Lord is still delaying His promise. Yes, and, and, and not only is the Lord still delaying his promise, the Lord is still saving people. Amen. That says to me that heaven still has room. And that not enough people have been brought into salvation to satisfy our Lord. God's grace, his amazing grace is still reaching Still calling, still urging, still inviting people in. There's room at the cross. Could I have a better amen? There's room at the table, room in the house, room in the kingdom, room for you, room for your family, room for your neighbors, room for your co-workers. Are you, are you listening this morning? Jesus has delayed his coming. That means there's room for the people around you to, to come into. Relationship with Jesus. Do you understand now that that's God's priority? And in the last days, listen to me, I declare to you this morning that God's priority for these troubled days is the saving of the lost. We have established our own priorities, but our priorities do not trump God's priorities which is saving people. Many Christians are wrapped up in political platforms and social projects and worldly efforts, but they haven't witnessed to an unbeliever about Jesus or invited an unbeliever to church in decades. I declare they have lost sight of the priority of God. It, let me just say, to, say this to you. If you're all about voting, but not about witnessing, you are off track, buddy. 
I know it's important to invest and to, and, and, and to be salt and light and all of those things, but the first area in which we are called to be salt and light is sharing the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ with the lost and the dying. Now, you, want, you, you don't want to hear that message? Sorry. For now the Lord waits. The Lord is patient. The Lord is calling sinners to salvation. But remember the words from Hebrews 10, 37. In just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. So, the, I hope you're following the outline with me today. Though there is love in God's delay, there is a limit to God's delay. And verse 10, Peter writes, but the Lord will come like a thief. The Lord will come like a thief. Everybody say, like a thief. The Lord will come like a thief. What does that mean? Suddenly, unexpectedly. The Lord will come with a shout and with the sound of a trumpet. The Apostle Paul also wrote in 1 Thessalonians 5 that the day of the Lord would come like a thief. Jesus himself declared in Revelation 16, Behold, I come like a thief. Blessed is he who stays awake. What's Jesus saying? Jesus saying, because I'm coming suddenly and unexpectedly, you better be spiritually awake and watching. 1 Corinthians 15, 52 says the coming of the Lord will take place in a flash in the twinkling of an eye. So Peter asks the question. We're coming down to a close here. Peter asks the question, in light of all this, in light of the absolute assurance that Jesus is coming again, what kind of people ought you to be? Okay? Engage God's promise. Examine God's patience. And then three, we must embrace God's priorities. What kind of people should you be in, in light of the impending return of Jesus? Well, five simple truths that we'll look at quickly. Number one, we must be godly. We must be godly. Look up at me, everybody. Look up at me. As followers of Jesus Christ, we are commanded and required by Scripture to continue to walk in obedience and faith before the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you here today? No, the Scripture does not teach us that you can say a sinner's prayer at nine years old and live for the devil the rest of your life and be ready for the coming of Jesus. No, that is error and does not belong in Christian teaching and preaching. Are you here? And Peter said, the first response Peter gives is this. In light of the fact that Jesus is coming again, you must be godly. Listen to it in verse 11. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Verse 14, so then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this coming, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. How many of you here today want to go to heaven someday? Say amen. And how many of you do believe Jesus is coming again someday? Say amen. If that's true, then my urging to you today is this. Stay right with God. Are you listening? Stay right. Don't let some sin control your life. Don't be living a hypocritical double life. Don't be walking in disobedience to God. Get yourself right with God and live for God. Be holy. Be spotless. Be blameless. Be at peace with God. And live a holy and a godly life. We must be godly. Secondly, we must be guarded. Verse 17, therefore, dear friends, since you already know this, be on your guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of lawless men and fall from your secure position. Well, there's so much in that. There's a whole sermon right there. But let me just say this. Don't let anybody in this world deceive you and pull you away from a relationship with God and from obedience to Christ. Because the danger is, if you are carried away by error, you 
run the risk of falling from your secure position. I want to be secure, don't you? I don't want to, I don't want to, I, I, I do not want to have walked with the Lord and known the Lord's grace and saving power and then to be deceived by the world, the flesh, and the devil or by error, the error of lawless men who are bringing forth false teachings. I don't want to be de- deceived to the place where I fall from my secure position. Hmm? We must be godly. We must be guarded. Thirdly, we must be growing. Verse number 18, Peter writes, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Every season of life in this world is a season for spiritual growth for Christians. Are you listening? My good preacher friend I talked to this week said, I'm afraid that many Christians in this season of time have not used this season of strangeness and difficulty to grow in the Lord, but to become lazy in the Lord. And I urge you, people of God, don't let any situation in this world cause you to let go of the pursuit of God and the love of God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. This ought to be a season of drawing close to God and growing in Him. Amen. We must be growing. Fourthly, and we'll go back to to a previous scripture for this one. We must in this season be gospelizing, sharing the gospel, telling people about Jesus. Verse 9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. How many of you understand with me this morning that if, the, if it's God's priority that the lost be saved in these last troubled days, that ought to be our priority as well. Say amen. Not, not only through missions and giving to missions and supporting missions on the other side of the world, but I'm confident there are plenty of people right here in Jefferson City, Missouri and mid-Missouri who need a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We cannot give up on the world in the days in which the darkness is prevailing. We must rise in the power of the Holy Spirit and be witnesses to the world in which we live. Say, so I've just never been much of a witness. You need, to, you need to be filled with the Holy Spirit, my friend. None of us in our flesh are necessarily bold witnesses. That's why we need the power of the Holy Spirit to strengthen us. You say, well, I'm just, I'm timid in those areas. Listen, get with God until the power of the Holy Spirit fills you so that what's in you has to spill forth from you. The power of God to be witnesses. <laughs> we must be reaching people with the gospel. We must be godly. We must be guarded. We must be growing. We must be gospelizing. And lastly, as we close this letter from Peter, we must be glorifying God. Peter closes the letter in verse number 18 with these words. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen. Amen. And I don't know about you, I enjoyed worship this morning, didn't you? I enjoyed worshiping the Lord together. I don't want to give up the privilege of worshiping the Lord together as the people of God forever. Oh. Did you ever miss a church service and, and think, oh, I, I, must, I might have missed something? Church, oh, I don't want to miss that, that eternal worship service. In heaven. I don't plan to miss it. How about you? I'm going to keep on the firing line. Amen. And keep my trust in Jesus and walk close to him. Because God has called us to anticipate his coming. And to live in that light. We must be living every day. Like Jesus is coming again. Living like Jesus could come today. I have a lot of great memories from my childhood growing up over on East Atchison Street, down on the old south side, right around the corner from Freeman Mortuary, 
just down the street from the old Safeway. Right down there we grew up and one of my favorite memories is the big neighborhood games that we kids used to play. We'd stretch out across that old neighborhood, holler back and forth. I remember playing those giant games of hide and seek at which my twin brother always cheated. Oh, oh, no, no. Oh, he's got a mask on today. Good, good. Believe me, my brother Joel can talk whether he has a mask on or not. I remember those big hide-and-seek games we'd scatter all over that neighborhood. And we'd count down. Finally, somebody would holler out, Ready or not, here I come. You know, one day Jesus is going to step out of heaven in the clouds of glory. He's going to come in the clouds. Going to give out a shout. The voice of the archangel, the trumpet call of God. The dead in Christ will rise first. We who are alive and remain, writes the Apostle Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall, these are some of the sweetest words known to man. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Oh, oh, oh. aren't you looking forward to that? Jesus is coming again. Let's be ready. Amen. Amen.